Today's lecture is about the Lotka Volterra model. And just to tell directly what it is, this is a model from biology, uh, and it is also so called the predator prey model from biology. So in this case, we have two species. One, say the foxes, they're called the prey, uh, sorry, the predator, and the prey, maybe the mice or whatever foxes eat, uh, is, is the second uh, um, coordinate. And um, so this is going to be an ODE in two dimensions. And what we are going to do is understand the behavior of this uh, ODE. Uh, in particular, we're going to analyze the stationary points uh, and we're going to introduce so-called null clines to aid drawing the face portrait and then finally and that is the new mathematical concept that we will use that is Lyapunov functions And these are used to prove either Lyapunov or asymptotic stability of stationary points. So what is this model? Well, let's start with the prey, which I want to indicate with the variable x. So x dot is the time derivative of how this population grows. And if there are just prey, let's say mice, and they have enough to eat, then their population will grow exponentially, which is usually, uh, well, you recognize this uh, linear equation, but now, uh, there will also be foxes, and the foxes I want to indicate by y, and then we get this equation, and now you see that if y increases, then the growth rate is less, and if uh, y is more than 1, then the growth rate is actually negative. And that means that more mice are being eaten than uh, new mice are born, and the population will decrease. On the other hand, the predator, so that will be the foxes indicated by Y, they will uh, only uh, increase when there is enough to eat. So if there's nothing to eat, they will have a negative uh, uh, growth rate, and that means they go exponentially fast to zero. Well, I say here minus one, but I could put some parameter there. This parameter alpha, I will take positive. Uh, however, if there is enough to eat, and that's what I indicate by this x, so if the mouse population is big enough, and especially bigger in this scaling than 1, then uh, this term will be positive, and therefore the foxes will increase. But if the foxes increase, then eventually their population grows above 1, and then the mice start to decrease. And if the mice decrease, then eventually 
this rate will be negative and the foxes start to decrease. And so we will see some kind of oscillating behavior between increase of mice followed by increase of foxes, then decrease of mice because too many are eaten, which follows is followed by decrease of the foxes. <coughs> Well, this is, of course, only one way of saying it, so you could do it more generally. Uh, well, first of all, of course, only x and y greater or equal 0 is physically relevant. That is to say, we will stick to the first quadrant. And secondly, more general, You could think of this equation where I have ax minus b. Oops, that should not be a. That should be a y. Times x and y dot. Is it? No, actually not. The y should be here. Uh, or cx minus d times y. Uh, but this can be reduced to the equation star. And what is star? Well, throughout, I want to call this star. Uh, by changes of coordinates, including Time. Okay, so I just one more bit of notation. I want to call this two-dimensional thing f of x and y, where f is called the vector field. Okay. Okay, so we are going to analyze this particular system. And to do that, I first need to compute the stationary points. To find the stationary points, we need to set f of x and y equal to zero. Now f has two components, but if you look at the first component, that is x times 1 minus y. So first thing to try is x is equal to 0. And if that is the case, then in the second coordinate we have minus alpha times y. So that means that y is also 0. And second one, Look again at the first coordinate. The other possibility to make this zero is by setting y is 1. And in this case, I have alpha times x minus 1. So that means I, y is equal to 1. That means I have two stationary points. One is here, 0, 0. And one is more or less over here, which is 1. One. Okay. Now, what type of points are there? Well, first of all, there are no others. I think you agree with that. No other stationary points. Now, to find out what type they have, we have to look at the derivative of this vector field in a point x, y, and that means that I just have to take the partial derivative of the two components, and that gives me a matrix which looks like, if I'm not mistaken, like this. Now for the second one, first times alpha, and the derivative with respect to y is 
this. Okay, so now we're going to plug in those two stationary points. So let's first do zero, zero. Then this matrix becomes one, zero, zero, minus alpha. So the eigenvalues are just on the diagonal, minus alpha less than zero, less than one. So we have a negative eigenvalue, a positive eigenvalue, and that means it's a saddle point. In fact, this equation when x is zero or y is zero is sufficiently uh, simple that we can find solutions. So x is zero implies x dot is zero, and that means that x t is zero for all time. And if x is zero for all time, then the y direction, we get y dot is minus alpha y, and that solves as y t is some initial condition times e to the minus alpha t. And then we immediately have the solution that holds for when x is zero, and that means that holds for the y-axis. So if x is zero at the beginning, it will be zero forever, and the solution is y zero e to the minus alpha t. This is on the y-axis. Okay. We can do the same if y is equal to zero. In that case, uh, we have y dot is zero, and that means that y t is zero for all time. And then x dot is, let's look at it again, if y is zero, then x dot is simply x, and that gives that x of t is some initial conditions, e to the t. So this goes to infinity exponentially fast. And then we have these arrows and this solution is x0 e to the t on the x axis. Okay, so then let's look at the second. Uh, stationary point. So now I'm going to compute this matrix in the other stationary point when x and y is 1. So this can be 0. This gives me minus 1. This gives me alpha. And this gives me 0 again. So the eigenvalues, lambda plus or minus, are plus or minus i square root of alpha. And that means that I have a center. Okay, so this is a saddle. And this is a center. Now we know the behavior of solutions near a saddle. It will kind of do this. And we don't quite know the behavior near a center because if this was a linear system, then around this center you would have periodic orbits. But the system is not linear. So we do not quite know if these periodic orbits persist or uh, if these periodic orbits are uh, replaced by spiral orbits that is spiral either inwards and that would make this point stable or spiral outwards and make this point unstable. This is something that you cannot see directly from only the analysis of the linear part 
at the stationary points. So for that reason, we have to find some new techniques to decide the question. Is this center here, is it really a center? Is it stable? Is it unstable? What is it? No clients. Uh, these are regions in the phase space where one component of the vector field which I called F, is zero. So here, uh, the X part is zero, and that is the case when, well, in this case, we have to solve this, X is zero, or Y is one. So let's draw that in. X is zero, we already have here, that is the vertical axis, and then, this is the line y is 1 so these two curves are the uh, no clients for x and that means that at these no clients, the vector field does not have a horizontal component because the x part of the vector field is zero. That means it has to be vertical. So I can draw these arrows because the vector field is totally vertical on this line. Uh, but I do not know the sign, but here's, here's zero. And if you check uh, if At the second coordinate, you see that if x is less than 1, the second coordinate is negative, and that means that up to the point 1, the arrows are downwards, but if x is more than 1, that sign changes, and we get upward direction on this part of the node line. Okay, now we can do the same for the other null Klein, and that means either y is 0 or x is 1. So now we have this line. So these two curves are the null clients for uh, y. And on null clients, why the movement is perfectly horizontal because the y component is zero and then again we need to find on this null line or if it goes to the left or to the right so for that we looked at the first component if y is small then this is still positive so then we move to the right and if y becomes larger than y then this changes sign, and now the arrows are to the left. Now this suggests that orbits will go more or less like this. And now is the question, do they match up and form a periodic solution, or do they go inwards, and that makes this point a sink or they go outwards and that make this point a saddle so that's the thing that we cannot decide just from this analysis and for this reason we are going to introduce the next bit uh, and which will eventually lead to this new concept of Lyapunov function So what we're going to do is first try to eliminate 
the kind of implicit var variable t from this differential equation. Well, t is there because this is a derivative with respect to t, and so is this. But if we want to eliminate t, then we could say, well, maybe this y is just a function of x. And then we can wonder what is the derivative of y with respect to x. Okay, can do that. So then we use the chain rule and think of, well, y is actually a function of t. And x is a function of t as well. That means t is a function of x. So if t is a function of x, then if we take the derivative of t with respect to x, then with the chain rule, we just have achieved what we want, the derivative of y with respect to x. Okay. Now dy dt is y dot, and dt dx is, yeah, is the inverse derivative of as if x is a function of t. So what we get here is x dot. And now we plug in what we know that y dot and x dot are. That is alpha x minus 1 times y. And x dot is x 1 minus y. Okay, so now we have this equation and we can separate variables. So let's put everything with x on one side and everything with y on the other side. And then I get alpha x minus 1 x x dot is equal to 1 minus y, y, y dot. Okay, in this case, we can integrate. And on the left hand side, we get alpha times, well, this is 1 minus 1 over x. And to integrate that one, we get x minus log of x. let's say, plus an integration constant. Well, it's up to me where I want to put this integration constant. So let's put it, let's put it on the other side. Uh, the other side is uh, log y minus y plus this integration constant. Right, now I want to introduce some notation. A function f, a real function f, let's say of u, is going to be u minus 1 minus the log of u. And that means that uh, f of 1 is 0, f prime of u. That is 1, 1 over u, uh, and that is 0 at u is 1, as you can easily see. And that means that 1 is a global minimum of this function f. Well, it's only one place where the derivative is zero, so that has to be an extremum, the only extremum, and it's zero there. And if you look at this formula, uh, every other value, if u is very big, if u is very small, it will be positive. If u is very big, then this is big. If u is very small, close to zero, then this is uh, a very negative number, but it's called a minus in front, so it's also going to be positive. So then what I have, and with this notation, I can rewrite this one. So this one becomes alpha of f of 
x plus f of y and that's equal to a constant. Okay, so let's call this L of x and y. And then we see that L of x to y is a constant. And that means that L is preserved uh, is a preserved quantity on solutions of my differential equation uh, in other words solutions are confined to level curves uh, of this function L and therefore mostly that is to say most of them periodic because what is the case well we have to look at the level curves of l that is those sets where l takes a particular constant value now it it it, uh, it takes a bit of staring but uh, we know that the minimum is achieved at 1 1 because then both f of x and f of y are zero and that's the smallest value that you can get and the further out you go the larger the value becomes but uh, maybe you can kind of understand that uh, these are kind of circles not quite circles but not quite round but uh, topological circles so this would be a level curve of L, so maybe here L is a quarter, and here L is a is equal to one, and over here more looks like this. Maybe L is equal to ten there. And yeah, these are periodic, periodic solutions, and uh, the solution will have to go all the way because and that is what the vector field prescribes. And there are no other stationary points, so they have to go round and round and round. And now we have indeed shown that this point in the middle, the center 1, 1, uh, is indeed Lyapunov stable. So, we have found this preserved quantity, which I wrote down again, and I want to compute the time derivative of this L. Now, T doesn't appear explicitly, but it is inside X and Y, and that means that I need to use the chain rule to get the following. Okay, so I'm going to take partial the derivative with respect to x and y, and then I have to dif differentiate further. So this is x dot and y dot, and now I take the dot product, the inner product of those two vectors. Well, I can write it in short. This here, that's the gradient. This again is the dot product. And 
this is x dot y dot, which is the same as the vector field. So this is the vector field. And now the whole thing together. This is called the Lie derivative. Named after a Norwegian mathematician called Sophus Lie. Okay, so we're going to compute that. Uh, okay, therefore I need the partial derivatives of L, but it is easy enough to see from here because the partial derivative is just f prime. Okay, what was f prime? That was 1 minus 1 over u. So I can just plug that in and then I get that this is, okay, 1 minus 1 over x, 1 over 1 over y, top product with the vector field. Okay, so this is x1 minus y. And I think I see now that I put the alpha at the wrong spot. The alpha should have been here. Okay. And that means I get the alpha here. And then in the other component, I do not get the alpha, but I get the alpha. Sorry, I need to get the alpha over here. And in the other part, I get the alpha here because it's sitting in the vector field. And if I write this all out, I get alpha times this times x, that is x minus one times one minus y plus one minus one over i times y is y minus one times alpha times x minus one. And you see, because here's one minus y and this is one y minus one, these things nicely cancel. And that means that in this case, the Lie derivative is zero. And that is just another way of saying that this L is preserved over orbits because the value doesn't change with time. Okay, this helps us to find examples for the following definition. So, a function L and let's say this is the neighborhood of a stationary point into the wheels is called a Lyapunov function. If, well, first I want that L, let's call this stationary point P, in P is zero and it is strictly positive on this neighborhood except P. And secondly, if I compute L, At some, let's call this point Z, uh, at two points in the orbit of a point Z. Uh, where T1 is greater than T0. That is to say, I take this point Z, I flow for time T0, or I take this point Z and I flow for a longer time, because T1 is more than T1, 
uh, t0 and then the outcome should be that the second value is less or equal to the first that is to say l decreases along orbits that start in this neighborhood u if those two things are true then i want to call it a lyapunov uh, exponent if we have the strict inequality in part two and for all z in uh, u but not the stationary point and for all t1 greater than t2 then l is called a strict Lyapunov function. Okay, so Lyapunov function is something that is non-negative. It takes its smallest value at the stationary point and along orbits this L is decreasing. If it's strictly decreasing, then it's called a strict Lyapunov exponent. Well, if it's decreasing um, and also differentiable, it probably means that the derivative is non-positive. And therefore we can say, if the Li derivative of L is less or equal zero, then L is a Lyapunov function. And if it's actually strictly less than zero, uh, on this neighborhood minus the stationary point, then it is a strict Lyapunov function. So what we have found in this example of Lotka Volterra is a Lyapunov function. It is uh, not strict because the lead derivative was exactly zero, but that is good enough, good enough to show that uh, the stationary point is stable. And that's what I want to discuss in the next board. So, the theorem regarding Lyapunov function is the following. So, if a stationary point P has a, a Lyapunov function, then P is Lyapunov stable. And if it has a strict Lyapunov function, then P is asymptotically stable. So now the goal is to prove this theorem but I will only do it in a specific uh, case. I will do the proof only if uh, the lead derivative of the Lyapunov function L is 
less or equal zero, uh, respectively strictly less than zero. And the other thing maybe is good to remind you what is Lyapunov's stable. Stable. Well, that means that for every epsilon, there exists a delta such that if z is in this delta neighborhood of p, then uh, if I follow the orbit of z, uh, it will always be in the epsilon neighborhood of p for all t greater or equal to zero. And asymptotically, stable, that means that there exists a delta such that if I start again in this delta neighborhood of P, then uh, Z of T converges to P as T tends to infinity. Okay, so let's do the proof. So let's start with the first part, which is just the Lyapunov stability. And I assumed here that uh, the Lie derivative, which is the same as the time derivative of uh, any point in this neighborhood, is less or equal to zero. Uh, so this implies that if I follow the orbit and compute what the L values are, we get this inequality. Sorry, this is for t greater than t0. And we also know that L has its minimum mi, mi, mum at the stationary point P. And that means uh, that for every epsilon positive, uh, <coughs> there is, let's call it an eta, such that if I look at the set of points uh, such that the L of Z is less than eta, this is a subset of the epsilon neighborhood of P. And there is also a delta such that if I look at the delta neighborhood of P, this is itself contained in the set of points where L is less than Eta. Why is that? Well, Z, uh, sorry, P is the minimum of L, so in a neighborhood uh, it, it takes positive values. On the other hand, L is continuous, uh, and therefore, as I go only a little bit away from, um, from P, so if Z is very close to P, then L of Z is still very small, so I must be able to find some eta such that if I move no further away from z, that's such that L is still less than eta, that has to be contained in a neighborhood of P. And that means this is some kind of open set contained in this neighborhood, and in this open set, I can find yet a smaller open set, which is the delta neighborhood of P, such that it, that is contained in this uh, level set of L. Therefore, if Z is contained in this neighborhood of P, 
then z of t is less than eta for all t greater or equal to zero. So z of t has to be, well, it's in this set and therefore has to be also in the epsilon neighborhood of p. And this is Lyapunov stability. Okay, so let's move to part B. And this is a bit more elaborate. <clears throat> so let Z in this delta neighborhood of P as before. And now I'm going to take eta so small that the following is the case. If I take that all points W in this uh, delta neighborhood of P and LW is less than eta, take the closure, call this set uh, v, then this is still contained in the delta neighborhood of P. So this is an, uh, a different eta from before, let's call it eta prime. Okay, then we can conclude then V is forward invariant under the flow and compact. After all, it's closed and it is bounded. And since the Lie derivative is strictly zero on this neighborhood, except for P itself, uh, I can say that if I look at the orbit through some w, and w is in v, uh, and I only want to look at where t is, say, bigger than 1, and again I take the closure, and this is going to be true for every w in v, uh, and w is not the same as p, because then I do know that the Lie derivative is strictly negative. Now this set, this closure of this forward orbit, starting at T is 1, does not contain uh, W itself, which is W at time 0. So maybe it's good to draw, uh, make a drawing. So here, we have this delta neighborhood of the point P. Here we have some w, and we follow the orbit of w. Maybe it goes like this. And here is w1. Now, L of w1 <coughs> is strictly less than L of w, so maybe it's less than um, L of w minus some small number, let's call it uh, alpha. And then I can find a neighborhood, let's call it W, and <clears throat> W is going to be the set of all the points W prime such that L of W prime is larger than L of W, the point in the middle, minus L of, uh, uh, alpha over 2. So here, in this neighborhood W, L 
is still bigger than L over here minus alpha over 2. And here it's already LW minus alpha. So he's already smaller than anywhere in this neighborhood. And since L can only decrease, this point can never enter this neighborhood W again. And that means it doesn't matter how long you wait, uh, you just don't get close to W and therefore W is not in the closure of this forward orbit. Uh, by the same argument, uh, For w in the picture, if I take this w, I flow it for some time. And I wonder if this ever intersects w again. Then the answer is no. That intersection is empty for t uh, sufficiently big. Well, for good measure, let's take 2. Okay. That means not only this uh, point, this red point, little w itself will not return, the whole neighborhood around it will not return. Okay. So now we go back to the, uh, let's call this star. Now let's get back to this starting point here, this point uh, z. Okay, so by compactness, by compactness of uh, this V, um, we can find some limit point in V and a sequence Tn tending to infinity, such that if I follow the orbit of the point Z, and I record it at these times Tn, that that converges to W. This is just writing down what compactness means, every sequence in a compact set has a convergent subsequence with, in this case, the limit, the limit w. Now, if w is not equal to p, then what do we have? Well, here somewhere we have this point z. Let's say at particular times here, this is e of t1, z of t2, you get closer to W. So at a certain point, we enter the neighborhood the, uh, capital W. And as soon as that happens, we know that that point here can never return to W anymore because <clears throat> then, uh, yeah, star is, is, is violated. We know that this uh, set W will never return to itself once, once it exits. And that means that the point in, in uh, this red, uh, this orange point in this neighborhood cannot get close to little w again. Uh, then we can say, so if w is not this uh, stationary point itself, then uh, is violated. But if this forward orbit can have only one limit point, that is P itself, if that's the case, that means that P is indeed asymptotically Stable. And now I have filled the board to capacity, uh, but it's good that this is indeed the end of the proof. 
And I think it's also the end of the lecture.